welcome back to our next video. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion about um, issues with connections. Okay, and more specifically, we're going to be talking about a phenomenon known as block shear. All right. Okay. So here's we're going to let's set up our, our our situation as we start to kind of look. Okay. Suppose we have a connection of two plates. Now this will be like a plan view of the connection, and then this will be a side view. And I have two plate plates and a shear connection that are kind of lapped together, and I'm pulling on this plate with a load PU, and I'm balancing that with a load PU on the other side. And if this connection works properly, the load from this is able to pass through the plate, through the bolts, into the other plate, and then out the other side, okay, as part of our load path discussion on this. Okay, this is a what we call a single shear connection because there's one single shear plane that exists in the bolt. Okay, now when we talked about bolts, we'll talk about uh, more about the shear planes and single shear and double shear and those kind of things, but for us, that's not really our concern for the purpose of this video. All right, now if you think about that, aside from the things that we've already studied in our tension member analysis, because this is a tension member, we looked at our gross yielding phenomenon, we looked at our net fracture phenomenon, we investigated staggered holes, we've done a number of things with effective net areas to, to try to anticipate the capacity of this member. Okay, but what we haven't done up to this point is looked at, well, are there any other phenomena aside from, you know, gross yielding and net fracture that we need to be concerned about? And the answer is absolutely. All right, so there's actually quite a few cases on those, but the thing is, is, is that gross yielding and net fracture are design criterion, okay? These are the ones that you can anticipate when you're designing a member and use that to come up with the size of the member needed to hold the load. All the ones that I'm getting ready to illustrate to you today are more of a detailing type failure, a situation in which, you know, I put bolts too close together or they're too close to the edge or, or some combination thereof. They're easily fixed by altering the, the, the arrangement of the pattern of the bolts. Okay, so that's one of the, the biggest issues with, with connection design in steel. All right, now as we kind of look through this, there are going to be a couple of things that we're going to look at. Okay, and I want to show you a couple of the, the letters to kind of keep your eyes open for. Okay, so the first one you're going to see a lot of in this particular talk is going to be the letter V. Okay, it's generally it's in a, a subscript for us. Okay, and what V is, V stands for a shear plane because, again, V is what we call shear. Um, so these are shear planes, and these are planes that are parallel to the load, okay? And then likewise, you're going to see a lot of T's running around, okay? And those refer to tensile planes or um, normal planes. So if I put tensile on there, you'll have that one, okay? And those are ones that are perpendicular to the load. So, so if we look at possible ways that this guy could fail other than gross yielding and net fracture, we could be looking at a phenomenon by which I tear out chunks of the plate, Okay, all I need to do is come up with a failure mechanism that basically separates the member from the other side of the connection. So if I were to fail along here, that would be one possible mechanism if I form both at the same time. So the first case for this one that we would look at would be more of, you know, oh, I'm going to fail this and I fail along this line and I fail this line and I fail this line, then this piece here would be able to pull free. Okay, and the bolts and these little chunks that are left behind would be stay would stay attached to the connection plate behind. That's one possible phenomenon. Okay, and depending on what these dimensions are, it's possible this could happen. Okay, likewise, the opposite of this could also happen, right? If I had a dimension that was really really narrow here, on here, then I could be looking at well, okay, here are my shear planes that would be required to fail, and then this would be my normal plane or my my tensile plane, if you will here, and then that's a T, and that's a T, okay, that these are the tensile planes that correspond to these subscripts, so being able to identify the planes that will fail or is probably the, the hardest part of this whole process, so, I, you know, but the second case is the case whereby I rip the middle of this out, you know, and again, it has to do with the dimensions, if these dimensions are really, really small, and this is really, really big, this will be the case that controls, and likewise, if this is really, really small, and these are really, really big, then this will be the one that controls. We don't know until we actually do the strength calculations to prove it, and I'll show you that in this video. Okay, now, what we can look at is we've got to be able to identify the block that forms. You know, for this case, with two holes, I had either of these cases that could happen. But what if I had more, more bolts? Okay, well, clearly, one of the patterns would be this guy. 
right? In which I fail this as a shear plane, I fail that as a normal or a tensile plane, and I fail this as a shear plane. I could rip this whole chunk out, and that whole bolt pattern would stay behind on the other side as I try to pull over with a PU. Okay, now notice that in the same connection, if I do three, 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 I can't fail it like that, all right? Because the bolts that are here are still behind and they're helping to hold this piece in place. I have to be able to cleanly separate, separate this. So this is almost like a bounding envelope, kind of a line that goes around it that kind of clusters and grabs all of the bolts and allows them to be pulled away as, as one group. It's kind of the phenomenon that we're looking at. Okay, now, so that's one set of connection issues. Now, you might be thinking, well, there's some others that I, you know, that would make sense as well. And I'll show you those, but they won't be the purpose of this video, but just so you can kind of see the difference of them. Okay, two of them kind of go together as well. Okay, one of them is what we call the slicer condition. And that's basically where if I pull this, and, I, and we call it slicer, this isn't an AISC term. Imagine like, you know, you know, like the old cheese slicers that, you know, have a real thin wire that kind of pulls through the block that it's able to cut its way through. Well, think about the bolt as being that slicer, that if these bolts are small enough, I could actually get a failure whereby it just rips straight out the end. And again, try it with a piece of paper. Put a hole in a piece of paper and stick your pencil in the hole and then just rip it. Okay, and this is the phenomenon that you get. So if I could do that in all four locations, that would be a failure mechanism by which this plate could be pulled free of the bolts on the other side. Okay, so this will show up when we start talking about uh, bearing failures in, you know, in a later video. Okay, now there is also the bearing failure that if we're worried about deformation at the holes, I could get a case whereby, you know, the bolt basically pushes on the edge of the hole and kind of eggs this thing out. And now you've got a loose wobbly connection that may or may not transfer the load in the way that you want. All right, and those will fall into the bearing category. These are not the two cases that fall into block shear. Okay, and then the last one, of course, is, well, I could just break the bolt in two. And that's more of a bolt shear phenomenon. Again, we've covered that in a different video. So, so for us for today, Okay. I guess I ought to slide that down where you can see the picture of the bolt here. That if I pull on the plate, I get a shear force across the bolt, and then that's matched by a shear force across the other one, and then basically this exceeds the shear stress allowed in the bolt shaft, I can separate it. Okay, all right, so for us today, what we're going to look at doing is we're going to look at doing number one and number two, or trying to identify these block shear phenomenon. Okay, now once you've identified a phenomenon, now we can do some, some basic calculations. Okay, and that leads us into our block shear. Okay, now, the block shear formula is a little hairy. It's not bad, okay, but it's got some, some parts uh, to it that you've got to kind of be careful of, okay? So what they're going to say is, is that block shear is defined as a tearing failure at the bolt holes, okay? And the equation that we're going to cover is, J, is section J4.3 of the specification. This is, the section J is all about connections. Now, a lot of your textbooks, you know, I, I, I've seen textbooks where they do block shear when they do the tension member design, but this is, again, this is more of a connection detailing issue than it is a tension member detailing issue for the reasons that we stated earlier. All right, so if you flip to 16.1-138, you know, you'll find this formula, okay? And so the formula is um, basically it's an inequality, okay, where I'm going to calculate this piece of it, okay, which is 0.6 FU ANV plus UBS FU ANT. So here are all our N's and V's running around, all right? So I've got an FU, that's the ultimate stress of the steel. I've got an A and V, so this is the net area due to shear. And I'll, I'll show you how to calculate these here in a second. Um, we have an FU, again, for the ultimate stress, and I have an A and T, so this is the net area of the tensile plane. Okay, and then this UBS is a kind of a stress distribution, which, again, I'll show you that as well. Okay, that's one side of the equation. Okay, and I'm going to take the smaller of that equation or... This other equation looks very, very similar, okay? And again, this is less than or equal to, so I take the smaller of these two when I do these calculations. And in this one, it's 0.6 FY AGV. So now we're doing a yield stress on the gross shear area plus UBS FU A and T. And you'll notice that the second term in both of these is exactly the same, okay? So the only thing that's changing is that front term, okay? And you'll notice both of those terms have to do with the shear planes. One is a net shear, and one is a gross shear, okay? And if you remember your definitions for net and gross, gross meant without considering holes, and net meant that if there were any holes present, you subtracted them off. We did those back in the net fracture calculations when we were doing tension members, okay? All right. Now, the reduction coefficient, this UBS, is a coefficient that has to do with some of the, the stress distributions, and I'll show you that here. 
Let me open the book up real quick. Okay, and if you go and you look, we're looking back in kind of the, the commentary, if you will. Okay, and this is the commentary that goes with those formulas for, for block shear. And if you look at it, most of the time it has to do with how the stresses are distributed in the connection. And so you can, you'll see that in our example, we're going to kind of talk about this guy. But the idea is, is that for you know, a coped end of a beam, for a single line of bolt holes, it's assumed that the stress on this tensile area is fairly uniform. Okay, and all of these, that's kind of the phenomenon that we're looking at. The one that changes, and like I say, you can pull the book out and look at it yourself, is this last guy down here, okay? I like these graphics because they're all very clean and very clear what's going on, okay? But if you look at this last guy, um, for all the cases above this, UBS is 1.0, okay? But this guy's a little bit different. This is one in which I'm taking, I've coped a beam and I'm doing something, and then my connection is, is hooking here, okay? Which by, I've got some sort of rotational effect happening here. And so what happens is, is that stress distribution that was constant in the picture up at the top here, where it was a constant stress, is now becoming a varying stress. And so depending on the bolt hole pattern, this stress magnitude increases. And so for this, they say, you've got to do the, their, your uniform stress distribution for block shear is limited to 0 0.5. Okay, it's a very rare case, and you almost always know when you have it, but for the mo unless you have some other phenomena going on. But this covers the vast majority of tension members and connections and then those kind of issues. All right, so I'll leave that as kind of a reading exercise for you. Um, it's good practice to get into as you're, as you're reading through the specifications and getting into the formulas that if you remember, the gray pages are all the commentary. That's kind of the, the, the how and why AISC did what they did and kind of gives you some background into some of the research and some of those kind of things. So it's a very good thing to read those two pieces together as we look at that, okay? All right, so if we go through and we kind of look at this, okay, I'm going to break this down into two different categories, um, okay, and so the way that we're going to do this is I'm basically going to take each side of that first equation and look at them separately, all right, so the first one we're going to deal with is what we call uh, shear yielding tension rupture, okay, and I like to abbreviate this as SYTF, okay, so shear yield tension fracture, Okay, and so, and it has to do with the equation that goes with it. So this, the, and then what gives it away is these first two terms. So shear yielding, when I see that, I know that it's my Fy, and then I know it's my AGV side of the equation. Okay, in this case, that was the second side of the, of the, two, of the inequality that we showed you. Okay, and so what happens in this is, is if we look, AGV, we said, is the gross area subjected to shear yielding. So what the gross area would be then is going to be these lines on here. These are the shear planes, okay? And so the gross area goes from center of hole to edge of plate. It's that length multiplied by the thickness of the part, whether it's the thickness of the plate or if you're bolting through the flanges on an I-beam, it could be the thickness of the flange or if it, the thickness of the web if you're bolting to the web. You've got to, to, to kind of think three-dimensionally that, you know, if that's my direction, this is... That's my T, okay? Okay, so that's my AGV, and then my A and T then is my net area subjected to tensile fracture. So here's my tensile plane. Okay, and again, we're assuming a uniform stress distribution, and so the net area then is gonna be the center to center hole dimension of this thing minus the half a hole here and the half a hole here. And if you had other holes in the middle, you would subtract those off as well. So this is, it's the same thing you did with you know, the net area calculations back when we were doing the net fracture studies or the effective area, the effective area calcs on those. Okay, um, and then UBS, we just showed you on, you know, on, the, on that page in the manual that it's 1.0 for uniform stresses and it's 0 0.5 for coped ends of beams. Okay, so this is our SYTF calculation. So the hardest part is calculating these areas and I'll show you how to do that. All right. Otherwise, this whole process is pretty much just kind of plug and chug or verify at the end. Okay, the next one that we have is um, shear fracture tension yielding. This is the other side of the equation. So it's SFTY, and again, this isn't in the AIC manual, but it's how I remember it. Okay, and so the shear fracture then it means that the shear, anything associated with the V was using the fracture stress, which is the FU. Okay, and so we're going to do the 0.6, FU, A, and V, and then again, this last term is the same for both sides. On this, so A and V is the net area subjected to shear rupture. So now we're taking these shear planes here, and I'm going to subtract off the amount of the holes. So in this case, I would have a half a hole here, 
that goes from the center of the hole to the edge. That's a half. And then I get a full hole here. So that would be one and a half holes, assuming that the holes are the same size. Okay. And then the tension for the for the tension failure part of it, that's the same as what we had before. It's a net tension. So it's the center to center minus a half a hole minus a half a hole. Okay. And that's the way that we calculate this. So this whole process is all about calculating these areas that we're dealing with. Okay. And once you've done that, all you do is choose the smaller of the two values. Okay. And that gets you your resistance capacity. Now, I think I listed this as TN. It's probably better suited to call it as an RN. Get those on there. Okay. And that gets us the two equations. And then basically you choose the smaller of the two as the limiting. Okay. And then um, the last piece that you need, as you might suspect, is we need a phi. Okay. And every one of these is a rupture limit state. So most often that's associated with 0 0.75. So phi for both blocks your cases is 0.75. Okay. All right, so let's give one a shot and see what we can do. All right, so let's take a look at this example that we have. What we have is we just have a simple four by four by quarter angle with three seven eighths inch diameter bolts that are spaced at three inches, three inches, and an edge distance of one and a half here. Okay, and then oriented in this direction, it's one and a half inches from the center of the hole out to the edge, meaning that it's two and a half to the back. Okay. We know that the angle is a quarter of an inch thick, okay, and that it's connected to a gusset plate behind it that's three eighths inch thick. Now, I'm, I know the piece that's going to control is the angle because if the hole dimensions are exactly the same, meaning that the spacings are the same on both, then the block shear that would occur in the gusset plate is going to be a whole lot higher than in the angle because a quarter of an inch is less than three eighths. Okay, this guy's going to take more to rip than it is this one. So that's why we're only going to look at the angle. But in reality, you would check both. Right? Um, we know that it's A36 for our angle. So Fy is 36 KSI, meaning Fu is 58 KSI. And we just want to kind of figure out, well, what's the capacity of this? All right, so we're going to start off and we're going to look at the shear yielding tension fracture case. If we look at it. And so here's our formula. And again, we're looking at SYTF. Okay, and so I know that that's the shear yield, so we're doing a yield stress here and a gross area of AGV. Now, if we look at that, the whole challenge in this process is coming up with our particular, our particular areas that are associated with it. So if this is the block that we were looking at, and I'll just kind of pencil in the holes that we were dealing with, look something kind of like that. The AGV would be this entire length without the holes. It's a gross area, if you will. Okay, and so I know that that length on this plate was seven and a half inches. It was three plus three plus a half, right? So it was three here, three here, and, or, and one and a half here. So we have that. And then I know that the thickness of this guy on this is a quarter of an inch. So the area that we're looking at failing is this whole thing right there. And so that would be seven and a half times the quarter thick. And you'll see those in the calculation. So here's the 0.6, 36 is FY. Here's the seven and a half and here's the quarter. That's the AGV value. And so that's how we're coming up with those dimensions for us. For the A and T, we're looking at the size. So if I draw the tensile plane of this thing, again, and I'm not worried about anything else behind it on here, the area that's associated with this failure then is this little guy, okay? And so we know that from top to bottom on this block is one and a half inches, okay? Because that goes up to the center of the hole, okay? But the question becomes, what's this, okay? And that should be fairly obvious that that's one half of a diameter of a hole, okay? So meaning then that the area that I want is this guy, Okay, and then of course you have your thickness of a quarter of an inch happening there. So our A and T area then is going to be our one and a half inches minus a half of a diameter of a hole. Okay, all multiplied by a quarter of an inch. Okay, now you'll notice that we didn't declare the size of the hole. So we've got to go in and figure out, well, what's the diameter of a hole? And so for a standard punched hole, we know that that's a... The diameter of the bolt, which we said was 7 eighths of an inch, okay, plus a 16th of an inch for damage, plus another 16th of an inch for damage coming from it being punched. Okay, if you drill the hole, that 16th doesn't show up, but most of the time we take that as an eighth of an inch. 
Okay, and so that's the value there. So it's the diameter of the bolt plus the eighth of an inch. So for our seven eighths inch diameter bolts, that's going to be seven eighths of an inch plus an eighth of an inch. We're looking at a one inch diameter uh, diameter of the hole. So half of that would be half of an inch. So that's how we're coming up with these particular numbers. And that's what you're seeing in the calculation here. So here's my UBS 1.0 because it's constant. 58 KSI is FU. Here's the one and a half wide minus the half a hole. So here's the half. There's that 0.875. That's the 7 eighths hole diameter plus the 1 eighth for the extra. That little tidbit that's written there. Now it's kind of hard to see, but it's there. And then I'm going to multiply that whole length multiplied by the 0 0.25, which is the thickness that we showed back in this picture right here. So that's how we do it. So if I run the math out on this, okay, the whole thing turns out to be um, uh, 41.25 kips. That includes a fee factor of 0.75. Now often when I do these, I like to write them separately where I do each of the terms separately so I can kind of get a sense of which one's doing most of the work. And you can see that in this case, it's the shear length that's doing a lot of the work. So you know you can tell that if i could get into two lines of bolts then maybe i could double that number and really drive this capacity up if i had to the tensile area isn't doing much and if you know if i go and i look to try to to try to you know increase that dimension because that's the only thing you can do really is move the holes on there i'm not going to get a whole lot of increase on that so my best attention is to look at coming up with ways to get a bigger agv value whether that's increasing the spacing or adding another spacing by adding a bolt those are all things that i can kind of look at as we start to go through there. All right, so going into then our second case, this is the, the shear rupture, the shear fracture tension yielding, SFTY. Okay, and it's pretty much the same process. Okay, remember that the second term is exactly the same, so I'm just gonna write that 14 and a half guy right here. Okay, and then the only one that I have to look at then is this 0.6 FU A and B guy happening here. So if we go back and we look at our picture, now we're looking at trying to where this was AGV. Now we're looking at A and V. Okay, so if I kind of draw this, there's a hole, there's a hole, and then it comes over to here, and then this thing comes down. That's the block. And if I kind of look at the areas that we're associating with this, the areas that have to fail in order to have an A and V failure is these little chunks. Okay, and so that would be my A and V. So A and V then is going to be equal to my my gross width if you will okay or i could do agv minus in this case i have 2.5 times the diameter of my hole okay so i have two and a half holes and then i multiply that by that thickness of 0 0.25 inches that would be the way i could calculate a and b okay or i could take the length of seven and a half and subtract off two and a half holes and then multiply the whole thing by 2.25 lots of ways to do it but what I want you to get out of this is kind of the visualization of the areas that have to be torn or ripped in order to be able to get this piece to come free. Okay, and so that's what we're seeing here. So it's 0.6, here's the 58, that's the, the FU, here's the 7.5, the whole thing. And now I've written this a little bit differently. You can see I have two, whole, two full holes and then I took off another half a hole here. Okay, and then, so that's the 7 eighths. And then of course I add in the eighth for the extra and then that whole chunk gets multiplied by a quarter. And when I do that, that amount ends up being 43.5 kips. Okay, and then of course the second term is the same as before. All right, so add them together, multiply by 0.75, and what you see is I get a capacity of 45.53. So that's not bad, right? I've got, you know, the calculations are hard, they're fairly close together, so one isn't a whole lot better than the other, so we're doing okay on that. Okay, but just for good measure, let's go in and let's look at the rest of the tension member design on this and show you a problem that shows up. Okay, so let's do the gross yielding case on this, okay, or GY case. Now, I've gone and I've looked up out of the table AG. It's 1.94 inches squared, okay, and so we know that that's going to be 0.9 FYAG, that tensile capacity. If I plug all these terms in, 0.9, 36 KSI, 1.94, I get a capacity of 63 kips, 62.9, if you will. And if I go through and do the same thing for the net fracture of the cross-section, we know that that's going to be 0.75 FU times the effective area, just for the sake of this argument, I called U as 0.85. Maybe I need to go in and look at 1 minus X bar over L. Okay. However you calculate the shear lag coefficient, I'm not too worried. I'm just throwing in 0.85 just kind of as a, a trial number and plug in everything else. You can see on this that our um, net fracture calculation is 62.5. So these two numbers are really close. This is actually a pretty good design for this member that I'm not going to fail it too early in yielding and give up a lot in net fracture and I'm not going to fail at a net fracture and give up a lot in, in gross yielding. Again, this is kind of the theoretical 
material strength of this particular member in tension, 62.9. The problem comes in is that we knew that the 41.25 controls because it was the lower of these two. But that's a drastic difference between here and here, right? So it means that even though I design a member that's capable of holding almost 63 kips, this connection can only hold 41. That's like a 50% less you know, amount. It's, it's, it's a huge difference, which means that this is an inefficient design in terms of the connection. Because again, I can always manipulate these numbers by changing factors. I can change the spacing of, the, of the, the bolts. I can change the thickness of the parts. I can change the diameter of the holes. I could add bolts. Oops. I could end up adding another bolt out here, which adds another spacing, which would drastically increase the shear values. So, so when you see something like this, this is never a good situation to be in. Um, now, there may be a reason that you needed a larger member. You know, maybe it's a, a serviceability criteria. Remember, you had L over R, you know, less than 300 was a criteria. You know, maybe maybe that's what kicked your size up, and you don't necessarily have that much load in it, but it's a serviceability condition. That's you know, that's an, a valid reason to have the situation. But if you're doing a full efficient design. This isn't very efficient because I'm buying a lot of material down here that I'm not actually paying for. And that's one of the major, major problems that we have. All right. So with that, I think we'll stop there and give you hopefully a kind of a taste of what the block shear calculations are doing and you know, kind of how we identify the areas and then more importantly, how you identify the shear areas and how you calculate AGV and A and V for these calculations. And of course, A and T is another thing that we're looking at. So... So as I said, as, as you're watching these videos, if there's anything that we can do, please be, you know, be sure to leave a comment down below on what we can do to make things better or more clear for you all. Um, as always, if you like the video, please uh, toss us a like, uh, subscribe to the channel, and we'll keep bringing in more, more videos of different topics in our engineering curriculum, uh, whether it's steel design or statics or what else. We're constantly adding to these cases and hope to add many more as the months move along. So anyway, uh, thank you for your time, thanks for your attention, and happy engineering. We'll talk to you all later. Thanks. Bye.